the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Could we have the parents and the sponsors and witnesses come forward? Good morning. Good morning, Remy. <laughs> you got to see this too, huh? Yeah. Our Savior Jesus Christ commanded baptism when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All of us are born into this world with a deep need for baptism. From our parents, we inherit a sinful nature. We are without true fear of God and true faith in God and are condemned to eternal death. But Jesus took away our sin by giving him life on the cross. At our baptism, he clothes us with the robe of his righteousness and gives us a new life. Our sinful nature need not control us any longer. We recall what baptism means for our daily lives as we speak these words. Baptism means that the sinful nature in us should be drowned by daily sorrow and repentance and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I give, forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In obedience to the command of our Lord and trusting in his promise, you've brought this child to be baptized. Jesus told us, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It is in baptism that God grants the new life of forgiveness, joy, and peace to little children. By the power of God's word, this gracious water of life washes away sin, delivers from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe. Receive the sign of the cross upon the forehead and upon the breast, marking you as a redeemed child of God. That's fine. Okay, a little bit more. Remy K. Kleindl, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has forgiven all your sins. By your baptism, you are born again and made a dear child of your Father in heaven. May God strengthen you to live in your baptismal grace all the days of your life. Peace be with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord commands that we teach his precious truths to all who are baptized. Christian love, therefore, urges all of us, especially parents and sponsors, to assist in whatever manner possible so that Remy may remain a child of God until death. If you are willing to carry out this responsibility, then answer, yes, as God gives me strength. Yes, yes. God gives me strength. Let us pray. Merciful Father in heaven, 
we thank you for the blessing of baptism by which you offer and grant the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Help us to regard our baptism as the robe of righteousness we are to wear all the days of our life. Look with special favor on Remy and grant her a rich measure of your spirit that she may grow in faith and godly living. Make us willing to carry out our responsibilities to those who have been baptized so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven through Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We continue our service on page 28 in the hymnals. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. This is your name in all the earth, Almighty God, merciful Father. You crown our life with your love. You take away our sin. You comfort our spirit. You make us pure and holy in your sight. You did not spare your only Son, but gave him up for us all. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. O Son of God, eternal word of the Father, you came to live with us. You made your Father known. You washed us from our sins in your own blood. You are the King of glory. You are the Lord. O Lord, our Lord, how glorious is your name in all the earth. Please rise. Let us pray. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for this morning's readings. I invite you to follow along on the back of your bulletin as we take in the portions of God's word for this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. Our first lesson, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 20, also serves as our sermon text for the day, so we will not have you rise to hear it read at that time. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brother Israelites. Listen to them. That is exactly what you asked from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. You said, Do not let me hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore, and do not let me see this great fire again, or I will die. Then the Lord said to me, They have done well by saying what they said. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their brothers, like you, and I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them everything that I command him. Anyone who will not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Any prophet who presumes to speak something in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or speaks something in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. This is the word of our Lord. 
If you would turn to page 64 in the front of your hymnals, we continue with the singing in unison of our psalmody for this morning, Psalm number 1. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, Whatever he does prospers. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed are they who hope, who hope in the Lord. The second lesson for this morning is taken from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. We read chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Um, the specific topic is meat that was sacrificed to idols. And the practice at that time was that, that to Zeus or to Mars or whoever the god was, the false god that the people believed in, they would offer uh, an animal for sacrifice in worship. And the meat that was left over got sold at the meat market. The people would have a, uh, a community meal. Um, and how do Christians deal with that? How do Christians deal with that? Other different things come up in this same, this same topic uh, of whether to have an alcoholic drink or not, whether to eat this kind of food during Lent or not. Um, there are people whose consciences are bothered by these things, and other people look at it and say, well, the Bible says this. This is okay. Here's, here's how Paul approaches it. Now, concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone supposes that he knows something, he does not yet know the way he ought to know. But if anyone loves God... This person has been known by him. So, concerning the eating of food from idol sacrifices, we know that an idol is not anything real in the world, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even if there are so-called gods, uh, whether in the heavens or on earth, as in fact there are many quote-unquote gods and many lords, nevertheless, for us there is one God, the Father from whom all things exist, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things exist, and we exist through him. However, that knowledge is not in everyone. 
Instead, some who are still affected by their former habit with the idol eat the food as something sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us closer to God. We do not lack anything if we do not eat, nor are we better off if we do. And be careful that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you, a person who has knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of this man, weak as he is, be emboldened to eat food from an idol's sacrifice? You see, the weak person is being destroyed by your knowledge, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And when you sin in this way against your brothers and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I do not cause my brother to sin. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. These words are written that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Please rise for the reading of this morning's Gospel lesson. The Holy Gospel for this morning is recorded in St. Mark's account. We read chapter 1, verses 21 through 28 in Jesus' name. On the next Sabbath day, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. They were amazed at his teaching because he was teaching them as one who has authority and not as the experts in the law. Just then there was a man with an unclean spirit in their synagogue. It cried out, What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked the spirit, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. The unclean spirit threw the man into convulsions, and after crying out with a loud voice, it came out of him. Everyone was so amazed that they began to discuss this with each other. They said, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He even commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly through all the region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. The congregation may be seated. We continue with the singing of our hymn of the day, hymn 395, Seek Where You May to Find a Way.
The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be yours as we hear and meditate upon his holy word. Amen. As I mentioned, we are using our Old Testament lesson for our sermon text this morning. I shall introduce it with the opening verse. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brother Israelites. Listen to him. Heavenly Father, through your word of truth, strengthen us in saving faith. Fill us with the knowledge of your love and strengthen the new man in us to walk with you by faith all our days. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, I, I think there have been moments of strife ever since that first instrument was put together to broadcast music. Dad comes into the house and the kids are playing their favorite music and he yells, Turn off that noise! Or, the kids, the kids are walking around crying. My ears are bleeding as they're listening to Dad's uh, playing his favorite tunes at full volume, the oldies channel. Um, there are people who, if they hear the kind of music they don't like, whether it's rap or hip-hop or country or whatever kind of music, they'll turn around and they'll walk away. Out of the room, away from the radio, away from the TV, or away from that company. And that is something that is, something that is a, a common thing for mankind. What we're looking at in our text today is something that took place similar to that, and, and we're tempted to practice something like that regarding God's word, and that's a much more serious thing. We have, we have Moses reviewing all of God's law for the children of Israel in this book, Deuteronomy, that means the second law, second giving of the law, before they go into the promised land and take possession of it. And he's taking them back to Mount Sinai, where God gave them all of the law the Ten Commandments, which we consider the moral code, God's standard of right and wrong, and all the ceremonial laws, how, how they were supposed to worship God, and all the civil laws, how they were supposed to conduct themselves as citizens in the land that God himself was going to rule over. And the very first thing God did at Mount Sinai was to tell them the Ten Commandments. Listen to to what it says in Exodus chapter 20, how the people reacted to hearing the Ten Commandments from God. Now, a lot of what is being looked at here are reactions to what they saw and heard regarding God's glory being present on the mountain. But just hearing God, the Almighty, the Holy One, giving His standard of right and wrong must have been a shock to their senses too. God is absolute and he requires absolute obedience to his commands and, and, and we hear in Exodus chapter 20 just after God spoke the Ten Commandments you shall do this and you shall not do that. It says all the people saw and heard the thunder and the lightning and the sound of the ram's horn and the mountain smoking, the people saw and they trembled and stood far away. The volume of God's glory and, and quite probably also the volume of God's holiness and his sharing the Ten Commandments was more than they could handle, more than their senses could take in. They were scared and so they talked to Moses. Moses reminds them of this. He says, that is exactly what you asked from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly. You said, do not let me hear the voice of the Lord my God anymore. And do not let me see this great fire again or I will die. And Moses continues, then the Lord said to me, they've done well by saying what they said. I will raise up a prophet for them from among their brothers like you. And I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them everything I have commanded him. And that promise 
takes us right to our gospel lesson for the day. Jesus speaking with authority and showing with power that he is the Son of God. Jesus had said more than once during his ministry, as people were objecting to what he said, these words that I speak are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. This prophet, like Moses, that came from among the children of Israel, is Jesus Christ himself, the promised one, the Messiah. And there have been people over the years that have said, well, Moses was talking just about any, any prophet in general here. But in this section, he's not. What other prophet was like Moses? God called Moses at the burning bush and gave him the position, you are going to be the one who delivers my people out of Egypt. And as God spoke to him, his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron got jealous. What are we, chopped liver? The Lord has given us things too to do, so we're, we're just like Moses. That's what they were telling the people, and the Lord scolds Aaron and Miriam. And here's what he says to them in Numbers. He said, now listen to my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision. In a dream I will speak with him. Not so, however, with my servant Moses. He is faithful in my whole household. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Jesus, the Son, communicated directly with the Father, and the Father gave him directly the word to speak and sent him on his mission into this world. Like he spoke directly to Moses. What is being said here is being said especially of him. And that's important for us to remember because Jesus gave his word to the disciples. He put his seal of approval on all of the Old Testament writings as God's word, and he added to God's word the New Testament writings that his apostles, by inspiration of God, wrote. And so this whole book is God's message given directly to his people through this prophet like Moses. Why is that important? Why is that important? Listen to this next verse. Anyone who will not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. In other words, everybody who looks at this Bible, the book, at Ton Biblion, that's what the word Bible means, the book. Anyone who looks at the Old Testament and the New Testament says, ah, that's just a bunch of words written by men about somebody, it's full of mistakes. Or they say, I like this part, but I don't like that part. God says there's going to be a judgment. If people will not accept the message of the law and recognize that they are sinners and repent, if they will not accept the message of the gospel and trust in Jesus Christ for forgiveness and life, then they're going to have to face God on the last day. That's what, that's what the Lord is saying here through Moses. He gives that warning. Now, why, why would this prophet be singled out? There were other prophets, weren't there? God had sent Nathan, for example, to rebuke David when he had sinned. And we've got the major and minor prophets from Isaiah through Malachi that God had their words, their prophecies written down so that we could benefit from them. They were prophets too, weren't they? In the last two verses of our text, he gives people who consider themselves prophets a guideline and a warning. He says, any prophet who presumes to speak something in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speak something in, my, in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And we've got a couple examples in the Old Testament of someone who put themselves up as a prophet 
But they were saying what the people of Israel wanted to hear. They wanted to be popular with the people and they contradicted what the prophet of God had said. And in the end of each account, they were proven wrong and they died. Why would such prophets be out there? Like I said, they wanted to say what the people wanted to hear. Timothy talks about this, in his, or Paul does in his second letter to Timothy. He says, there will come a time when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, because they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachings, teachers in line with their own desires. There will always be people who say, well, I like this part of the law. That makes me look good. But this commandment I'm uncomfortable with. This steps on the toes of my favorite sin. Or this exposes my hidden fault. I don't like that part. I'll ignore that. And some people have, have an earthly view of what heaven is going to be that contradicts what the Lord tells about the heavenly kingdom. And they prefer their version over what the Bible says. And God says, no, no, that's, that's not what you are to do. You are to hear the message of the Lord and trust in him. A true prophet of God, besides the prophet, Christ himself who came and shared the Father's message with us, the message that called people to repent of their sin and trust in him for forgiveness and life, is this. At Jeremiah's installation as a, as a prophet, he was told, you must go to everyone to whom I send you and say whatever I command you. In other words, a prophet was to be God's mouthpiece. In catechism class, we teach the kids that the job of a prophet is twofold. He was either to tell forth, announce like a town crier what the Lord had told him to say, like when when Jonah was sent to Nineveh to tell the people, repent. In 50 days, your, your, your city is going to be destroyed because of your sin. Or they were to foretell, to tell of future events that the Lord had disclosed to them, as when Isaiah said that a virgin would conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the job of any prophet was to speak God's word faithfully and only God's word. The job of the prophet, Christ, was to call people to repent of sin and call them to trust in him and know that through faith in him they had an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. That was their job. So what is our job as the audience of Christ's word of the words of the prophets, of the word in general. Did you, hear what, did you hear what Moses said in verse 15, the first verse? The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brother Israelites. Listen to him. That is our call. That is our call. Uh, we are far removed from Mount Sinai with the peals of, of lightning and thunder and the smoke rising and billowing. But how many people are just overwhelmed when they hear God say, be holy, be perfect, because I, the Lord your God, am holy, perfect. And we see God's Ten Commandments and we recognize, there's no way I can live according to these. There's no way I can keep all these perfectly, all the time, everywhere. How am I supposed to do this? And some of us, some of us are tempted to say, I don't want to hear that message. That's too much for me. It's too unpleasant for me. And walk away from it to turn the channel or to turn the volume down or turn it off. People will do that by falling away from church. They'll do that by separating themselves from fellow Christians. They'll do that by ignoring any input from the Bible that they come across. Moses says, listen, listen, because that law that condemns us also helps us to see our need for a savior from sin. And that same word that contains the law contains the sweet gospel that tells us that God promised to send a savior to deliver us, to pay for our sins and bring us back into a good relationship with God. Listen, he says, and not only listen, 
How, how many of you have done this? You put, the, you put your favorite music on, you start working at a hobby or a chore that you're doing, and the music fades into the background. You don't remember what words were being sung, which group sang what song. You were just busy doing stuff with music in the background. God says, listen, pay attention to my word. Don't just let it be out there in the background and ignore it. Hear what it's saying to you. Let it affect you. Let it guide you, both the law and the gospel, so that you have a relationship with the Lord that includes Christ's salvation and your eternal life. Moses provided a, a, a valuable uh, job, he played a valuable role among the children of Israel but nothing compared to Christ in his coming and carrying out his saving work for us. I pray the Holy Spirit works through the words that you've heard today and that you continue to hear as you, as you read, study God's word and hear it taught and preached, that it continues to show you your sin and your Savior and guide you to a stronger faith and abiding hope for the eternal life to come. Amen. Please rise. Having heard the message, we join in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed as found on page 31 in your hymnals. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We join in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, who came to seek and to save that which was lost. It is truly a blessed and faithful saying that you, God's own Son, came here to suffer, bleed, and die to redeem us sinners. And you have even supplied us the gift of faith by the Holy Spirit that we might personally make your salvation our own. Thank you, blessed Jesus. May we never again be wandering sheep, helplessly lost by sin and unbelief from the heavenly fold. Send your Holy Spirit to guide and protect us by your word. Keep our feet from straying into sin, our hearts from yielding to doubt and unbelief, and our minds from falling prey to false teachings. Give us continual victory over everything that would rob us of our trust in you. Keep our lives uncluttered by the attractions and cares of this world. O Savior, fill our hearts with such firm reliance in you, that we will be prepared at all times should death overtake us. May we successfully endure any trials that may test us in life and death, in prosperity and adversity, in good times and bad times. Draw our hearts close to you, whether it be pain or pleasure, cross or comfort, safety or danger in youth or old age, health or sickness, whatever our condition or station in life, Help us to glorify you by true faith and patient, godly living. Cause all who have been careless and slothful in spiritual matters to repent of their backsliding 
and to strive with the Holy Spirit's aid to be fruitful in good works. Lord, help us so that we are not weighed down with earthly matters and give us the desire to apply our hearts to heavenly wisdom. May it be of daily concern to us to live our lives ever more free from sin, doing what pleases you. Have mercy upon our human weaknesses and forgive us our many sins. Finally, make us partakers of your glory in heaven. Lord, countless sheep are still lost in straying, running swiftly but surely to their eternal destruction. Have mercy upon them and restore them through your means of grace. Give us a love for souls and make us bold to go out with the gospel to seek and to save the lost. May the blessings of salvation and of your gracious presence rest upon us and upon our homes and all who are dear to us. To the glory of your name we ask it. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the sacrament on page 33. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past he spoke to us through the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. O Christ, Lamb of God, you 
take away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We begin with the pulpit side uh, coming up the aisle. Uh, they will receive the, the elements and then, and then return, and then followed by the, the lectern side. Our uh, distribution hymn for the day is hymn 312. Take, eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sin. Take, eat. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sin. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins. Take, drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of sins.
Please rise, we join in the song of thanksgiving. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let all who seek the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He renews his promises and leads his people forth in joy. With shouts of thanksgiving, alleluia, alleluia. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. Serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 The congregation may be seated. We close our service with the singing of hymn 333, Abide, O Dearest Jesus. Good morning. 
We're glad you could join us for worship this morning. We ask our guests and visitors to feel welcome to worship with us again soon. We're almost done now. <laughs> one of my nephews one time, we were at a, at a special meal, some special occasion, he just, anybody prayed over this stuff yet? <laughs> Kids get right to the point. Um, we, welcome, we welcome Remy into the congregation of believers this morning. Um, we have a, a, the outcome of the annual meetings. Uh, some signing was being done this morning uh, at St. Paul and here as uh, before the service began. And the call to have me serve as uh, pastor of the dual parish is now signed. And I now have an official call to, to go home. And uh, probably next Sunday I will be announcing the outcome of that call. And, and I think for, we're formalizing things, but we've been working on this together for a while, haven't we? So I think we all know where this is going. Um, we're going to ask the voters to meet next Sunday after the service. What I would like you folks to do during the week, uh, we're taking a look at, we're taking a look at possibilities for the midweek Lenten services. Last year, we started out with having the services over at Morris and the people from Mount Olive and Graceville uh, and Trinity being invited to come over and join. And the first, first night, Ash Wednesday, we had about 100 people there and everybody's going, wow, this is neat. Um, and, then, and then March 17th, the state got shut down and that was the end of our Lenten services. Um, the possibilities are that we would do it like that this year since we're just getting underway as the dual parish, or the possibility of having alternate services, St. Paul's and Trinity, St. Paul's and Trinity like that, and then carpooling, or if neither of them works out of having services at St. Paul's Wednesday nights throughout Lent and having Thursday night services here. And Pastor Hannum and I are going to be exchanging pulpits during Lent and he said he would be good with any of the choices that we come up with. So if you could talk amongst yourselves, St. Paul's members are talking amongst themselves, at the end of the services next week, we'll have uh, the voters give us some input and then we'll, we'll figure out our path. I think, I think I've run out of things to announce. <laughs> God bless your day and your week. <laughs>